that's what I want to talk about this. And the reason is, is because this is what I believe. If you can really guess with accuracy where the lesion is, what, not only what artery it's in, but where in the artery it is, then it really helps the doc since it's a center. If you're, if you're calling in, you can say, look, we got a, a cardiogram which suggests that this guy has a left main lesion or he has a lesion in the high left anterior descending coronary artery, which we call the widow maker. That means that they activate the cath lab faster. They're ready for them. It may bypass even sometimes the emergency room or it'll get you on a fast track. And everything is, has to do with this sort of door to balloon time or ambulance to balloon time. The faster, you, because uh, it, it, the, the amount of time it takes before heart muscle dies is very finite. It's measured in periods of hours. So if you have, you only have that amount of time, and if you don't open up the blood vessel, if you don't open up the coronary artery within that period of time, either by a clot busting medication or by a balloon or angioplasty, anything, then that heart muscle is dead and you have all the, the stuff. But if you get to it in time, you can totally reverse the heart attack, and so the, the heart muscle may not be dead at all. And the major factor which determines how people live and die after a heart attack is how much muscle they've lost. It's not the major factor of why they die suddenly at the time of a heart attack, because that's an electrical short-circuiting. But what, what they do afterwards does. So you want to get to it as fast as possible, and if you can get them faster, then we think, and I hope, and I believe, that it will improve patient outcome. Now. I want to go over, before I get into what the ECG does, because what the ECG does reflects what's happening in the heart, I wanted to just review a little bit of the physiology of a heart attack, and that's, that's what this is. So when, when you stop, when you ac acutely cut off blood supply to the muscle, whether it's by a clot or by spasm, you know, or, anything like, or by a rupture of the vessel, like a dissecting aneurysm, something like that, then you, you totally block inflow. Well, that's obvious, but you also block outflow. There's nothing coming in, so there's nothing going out of that area. And as a result, the heart it doesn't have oxygen, it doesn't have glucose, so it goes into anaerobic metabolism where it burns uh, fatty acids without oxygen. And the end products of that, of that sort of um, metabolic event accumulate in that space because there's nothing to wash them out. And primarily it's potassium and hydrogen ions. The, the, in, the inside of the cell gets acidotic, potassium comes out of the cell, it accumulates in the extracellular space. There's a, the break, the fatty acid products accumulate, and that causes havoc with the electrical activity of the cells. The hearts first stop contracting. The muscle that's in the ischemic region stops contracting almost within seconds. It's a way to, to protect it, I think. It's a sort of a protective mechanism. So the bigger the heart attack, the worse it is. And well, to get into that, if you have a lot of heart muscle and that, all that stuff stops contracting, then the patient's sicker than stink, as you might imagine. You know, but it's, if it's a smaller one, then that's an electrical problem. Now, these end products of metabolism, they sort of accumulate and they change the electrical activity and they cause voltage gradients between the ischemic region and the non-ischemic region. Because it's, don't forget, the ischemic region is isolated to where the, uh, where the blockage is. So there's going to be gradients. And if you put a voltage difference in the setting of a resistor, ergo, you got a battery. That's Ohm's law. And if you put a voltage difference in, you, you generate a current. And that current is called the current of injury, and that current of injury causes ECG changes, and that's what you're recording. And the, whether or not, with the kind of ECG changes that you have, whether or not it's ST segment changes, T wave changes, or even the development of Q waves, depends a lot on where the recording lead is versus where the action is in the heart. If it's in the back of the heart, it's going to look different than it's in the front of the heart because the leads are in the same place, so they'll record it differently. Is that clear? That's an important concept. It, it gets into uh, the, the, the concept STEMI, ST, which stands for, you know, that stands for ST elevation, microinfarction. That's almost a misnomer because it takes away ST depression, but ST depression is the reciprocal of ST elevation. So if there's ST depression, there's got to be ST elevation somewhere. And if there's ST elevation, there's going to be ST segment depression somewhere. So they go together, they're, they're together, and you've got to keep that in mind. This is, this is sort of a cartoon. Frank Netter in his diet. Have you seen the Frank Netter cartoons or diagrams or illust medical illustrations of this stuff in, in SIBA? And this was what he, the, his concept of what's going on when you occlude a vessel. So what he's showing is this is sort of the infarcted region and it spreads, goes from 
from the inside to the outside. Okay, and around it is a peri-infarction zone, and this is more ischemic than this, and this is normal. And so you're going to have these voltage gradients going this way. They're going to be going in this direction, they're going to be going in this direction, they're going to be going in that direction. Okay, and they're going to cause changes. Now, early on, it doesn't, if the muscle is still not dead and it's contract, it's still conducting, you won't get Q waves, you'll just get ST segment changes. And that's usually what you've seen acutely. Uh, if the current of injury is sort of going towards the electrode, you get ST elevation. But if it's going away from the electrode, you go to ST depression. So if it's going in this direction, you get ST elevation. But if you put a lead over here, it's going to show ST depression. Conversely, if it were here, and you put the lead here in the back, it would show ST elevation, but the lead in the front would show ST depression. That's the concept. That's, that means that ST depression has got to be looked at. And if you look at it appropriately enough, you can begin to identify where it is. And we'll get into it because of the direction. It gives you an idea as to the direction of the injury current. And the direction of the injury current gives you an idea as to where it's coming from. That's the whole concept. That's, that's the gist of this, this argument, this presentation. So this is what I want to get across today. That the importance of ST depression. Uh, I don't know, do you, do, do you record right-sided chest leads? Okay, do you record posterior leads? A V4R? A V8 or a V9? Cool. V4, V3R, V4R, V4R, they're probably equally good. It's v, if you can get both, they're a little bit better. Uh, V8 or V9, you don't really need V8 or V9 as much as you need V3, V4, because anything that's happening in V8 or V9, the opposite is going to happen in V1 and V2. So that gives you a clue, because that's just, it's really opposite. But there's very little opposite to when you put a V3 here. To get over there, you have to be over here, and there's not much there. So that's why V3 and V4, and the right ventricle is right under V3 and R and V4R. So you get the advantage of being very close to where the action is. Okay, to the right ventricle, and that's, really, that's what you're looking for, is right ventricular infarctions. You, you, is this clear? I mean, you know all this stuff already? Okay. Stop me if I'm going too fast on this stuff, because I... Now, I want to go over a little bit the leads, because the concept of negative and positive leads is important. All the, you know, the chest leads and the augmented leads, we think of them as bipolar leads, right? They're, there's a negative lead, and it's certainly in leads one, two, and three, a negative lead and a positive lead. Lead one, the negative is here, positive is here. Lead two, the negative is here, and the positive is there. And lead three, it's that way, okay? The, the direction of the flow of current is going towards the positive pole and away from the negative pole. So that's pretty easy, right? The augmented leads are a little bit more difficult because the negative lead for AVR, AVL, and AVF is where? Do you know where that is? It's the combined lead, right? There's a resist right here, like that. So it's really somewhere around the center of the body. Not clear center because the third part isn't there. So it's skewed a little bit, uh, you know, a, a, away from the center. But nonetheless, it's sort of in the center. It acts as almost like a ground or a common lead. It's not quite common, but almost the same way. Still, you have your positive leads are way away in the arm leads or the leg lead, depending on where it was. Now, these are frontal plane leads. You clear about that? You know what I'm talking about? So that they show things which go from right to left or left to right, and superior and inferior. They don't show anything anterior and posterior, okay? But that's in, in, in the horizontal leads are the, show the difference. The horizontal leads really are in the horizontal plane, the chest leads. So they show anterior and posterior, and they show left and right, but they don't show, they actually show a little bit superior and inferior too, because, you know, V2 is up here and V4 is down here. So you come down, there's, there's not quite as much difference as that, but it's a little difference, depending on the build of the patient, how much difference there is. So it's not a pure horizontal lead. It's a little bit tilted, but it's basically horizontal. But you, that's where you get your anterior posterior and you get more lateral stuff. So it's important. And where's the negative lead for, where's the negative lead with the chest leads? No. It's in the center of the body, actually. The negative lead for the chest leads, it's a combined of all three leads together. And they call that a, a central terminal. The, the central terminal was developed by a guy by the name of Wilson years in the 20s. 
when he developed the chest leads. It's, he combines all three, the, the three limb leads together with a resistor so that it ends up somewhere in the center of the body. Okay, so it's right here, somewhere in there. It's sort of like it's inside the heart. Okay, everything else then is going to be outside and going all around here. If you put all the leads, no matter where you put them, you go around, here's V8, here's V9, here's V8, here's V4R, there's V3R. Okay, they're all positive relative to what's happening in here. The negative one is inside the body. That's important, and we'll sh I'll show you why, because left main lesions, which are the most serious, don't cause ST elevation, because the patient would have been dead if they caused, really, if it was totally occluded. But the occlusion spontaneous releases, it causes ischemia. It's only ST depression, but it's all over the place, but all the leads show it. And that's an important thing to recognize, and that's one of the reasons patients are not, uh, 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 are not recognized as having a major event. Yeah. Well, that's just, that's what the that's not yeah that was the report of the of the article seven or more is what we use but even six or more I'll tell you if I see a patient who's having chest pain who's got ST segment depression in a lot of leads with a slow heart rate a reasonably slow heart rate and they don't have and they're having chest pain man I call that left main ischemia and I get them to the cath lab as fast as possible that's a biggie I'll show you those are the criteria that we use and they're also in this paper. So it's very important to realize where these negative and positive, because all these leads, even though we call these unipolar leads, they're really bipolar. It's just that the second one is, is the, the mix of all of these, and it's located in the center of the heart. OK? Now, I want to review the coronary circulation just for a little bit. Are we doing OK? Yeah. I don't care about anybody else. Keep going. Are we doing all right? <laughs> yes. OK, cool. OK. So, the coronary circulation. How many arteries are there to the heart? Primary or total? Primary. You don't know that. Three. Three or two? The answer is yes. Three or two, depending on how you count it. Okay? The left main comes out and it breaks into these two big vessels, which is the left anterior descending and the circumflex. They both come off the left main. The left main comes out of the aorta out of uh, this cusp of the aorta on the left-hand side of the aorta. That's the left-sided circulation, if you will. Okay? It's very important. The right coronary artery is the second or third, depending on how you count it, right? So it's either way. This is the right coronary artery. Okay? Now, if you look at this, this is the, this is the if you're looking down through the chest wall, the heart's sitting here in the chest. What's, where's the left ventricle relative to the right ventricle? Yeah, it's not, it's posterior. That's the key. It's so it's almost that the calling it left and right is not quite the way we should have done it. We should have called it left posterior and right anterior because almost the whole anterior surface here is the right ventricle and the septum is behind it. So the whole right ventricle is sitting anterior to the left ventricle. So this surface here is all right ventricle. This side is left ventricle. The left, the left anterior descending artery runs down in a groove, which is right over the interventricular septum. The septum separates the two ventricles, right? It also supplies the interventricular septum. Not an, not an unimportant feature, actually. Uh, and it comes down here. Now, how much, of the, how much of this area depends on how long the vessel is. There's a lot of variation in this. How many branches, how long the vessel is, that's a genetically determined business. And it all, no two patients are the same. And so a little bit, the results of distal stuff becomes a little bit foggier in the apical stuff. But the right ventricle, by and large, is supplied by these branches coming off the right coronary artery. The left ventricle primarily is supplied by branches which are coming off of the left anterior descending and the circumflex, which are both branches of the left main. Now, the key is going to be how do you identify where those blockages are. I'm going to make the hypothesis is that we ought to be able to tell if it's up here, up here, up here, or up here. Because if it's, if it's up high, it's, it's de depriving a lot of heart muscle of circulation. And, and that means that part of the muscle isn't going to beat, and the patient's going to be, again, is, is going to be sick. 
And if they infarct those biggies, then they really have a lousy heart afterwards, and they're going to be in heart failure, and they're going to have arrhythmias, and they're going to have to have defibrillators, and they're going to die soon. And so it's not a good thing. It's something that you really want to avoid. Okay, so how do we do that? This stuff is from uh, Hein Wellens and his group. Wellens, and they wrote a very lovely book about uh, coronary artery disease and infarctions and, and how you use a cardiogram to do this. Well, this is if there is a proximal LAD lesion. Global ischemia of the whole anterior and septal aspects of the left ventricle. The whole anterior and septal aspects. The SC segment of the SC segment vector points in a superior direction because the basal section is involved. As you're up high, you're above these branches which are going up to supply that part, and all of a sudden your electrical vector is going not just as it going to the left this way, but it's going superiorly. And if it's going superiorly, what's going to happen to the leads that are inferiorly? It's going to go opposite. So you're going to get ST elevation in AVL and one, but ST depression in two and three and AVF. And that ST segment depression tells you that that's very superior. I mean, it's a very important finding. So you want to look at both of those sides. Also, if it's up here, if it's way up high, a lot of the stuff that's happening on the apex and down here is going to be counterbalanced by what's happening up here, and you won't see so much in the V3 to V and V4 to V6. So you, the chest leads will show primarily V1 to V4. It'll be one AVL, and then the reciprocal of that will be in the in the inferior leads. And if you can see that on a cardiogram and you can call in and you say, this is a high LA, we used to call that the Widowmaker. That's the Widowmaker location because patients die suddenly from them. So if you can identify that and say, listen, guys, we got a high LAD lesion, that that's a very important finding. It truly is. I mean, that's, that's important. This is the cardiogram of a patient like that. Okay? And what it says is that, look, we have ST elevation in one. Okay, and V1, V2, and uh, all the way to V4. No big stink. It's an anterior infarction. It's an LAD lesion. But if you also look at it, you have a lot of ST elevation in AVL, which means it's now going up towards the left shoulder. And at the same time, we're seeing ST depression in leads two and a little bit in lead, uh, uh, lead, lead three and a little bit in AVF. It's going away from lead three. It's going down this way, so it's going up here. It's opposite of AVL. And, and that's a terribly important finding. So not only is this important, but the reciprocal is important also. And the fact we're not seeing all, all that much here. Now, these are the V4R, V3R, V3R, V4R, and V8. And they don't show much because we're not involving the right ventricle, and we're not involving the posterior segment of the heart. Okay? Now, if you were to draw, uh, just picture where that, ST segment is going, you would have it going in this direction. So there are machines out there. Philips is actually making a machine now that you don't have the access to it. But for in hospital where they show the vector of, of what that ST segment is, and that's it. But you do that by looking at this. I mean, this ain't magic. This just comes from here. They just take that and they put this, they look at the ST segments and they draw where it's going as a function of time and it becomes this loop. So it's not magic at all, really. And you can visualize, as soon as you begin to feel comfortable and you look at the ST segment's elevation, you look at the depression, you can begin to visualize where that's going. And you say, hell, that's going up to the base of the heart, man. That's a bad thing. It's obvious an LAD lesion. That's what we think is going on. Are you, are you, are you happy with that? Does, does that make sense? Because that's if, if you get anything out of this, that's one of the points I'd like you to, to look for. So that when you see patients, you look for that. You don't just look where the ST elevation is, you look where the ST depression is. Because it's really just as important, okay? And it really helps. Now let's go back. This is now the posterior side of the heart, or the inferior aspect coming up from the diaphragm. When you're looking up at it like this, it's the posterior surface, okay? This is that circumflex branch coming around here. This is the left ventricular side. This is all posterior aspect of the left ventricle. This is now becomes a little posterior aspect of the right ventricle. This blood vessel is called the posterior descending coronary artery. It supplies, and it can come either off of the right coronary or off of the circumflex. 
either way, and you don't know that in advance, but we have these, but there are criteria that we can use to tell because that's the vessel that really gives you most of the posterior uh, portion of the heart muscle and it is the one that's responsible for a posterior infarction. What you don't know is whether it's coming off of the right of the circumflex. It can come off of either. It's not terribly important. I would do want you to figure out what's happening if you have a proximal, if it's high on the right, because high on the right, because if it's high on the right, as it is up in here, it involves the right ventricle. If the right ventricle stops beating, the blood never makes it to the left ventricle, doesn't make it to the lungs, and it's an entirely different physiology. You treat the patient differently if you know they have a right ventricular infarction than if they don't have one. So recognizing, rec can you hear me back, can you hear me? Recognizing a, a right ventricular infarction is important because of that reason. So if you can call in and again say, look, We've looked at this as ST elevation in, V1, in V4R, V3R, that we think that there is criteria which tells us that this is a proximal right lesion. That makes, that's important information for the people who are doing it. Okay, so how do you tell? Well, if it's going to involve coming off of the right side, it's going to involve more of the right ventricle. So that ST segment vector, the involvement's going to be more on the right. The ST elevation is going to be more on the right than it is on the left. The left ventricle is over here, the right ventricle is kind of over here, and it's going to be more anterior. You with me? That identifies it. So if it's more going in this direction, this is lead three, this is lead two. Both of them are down here, the inferior wall, so they'll both show ST elevation. But this will show more on, on lead three because it's on the left side relative to, so you look and you see in which lead is ST elevation greater. Also, if it's going here, it's going away from here. And so you'll begin to see ST depression in AVL. Again, though, so that's, and it tells you, once you see that, you say more, S, more ST elevation in three than in two and depression in, in, in AVL, you gotta say it's going there. You've got to go there, and if it's going there, it's a right coronary artery. And if, in addition, you see evidence of, of ST elevation in V4R and V3R, then you have a right ventricular infarction, you have a proximal right coronary artery occlusion. And, and you can tell the people that. And that, if you can do that, you will impress the bejesus out of everybody else around. And you say, hey, guys, I'll tell you where I think this lesion is. I'll tell you, I'll bet you half a buck it's going to be in the heart, you know. And you'll be pretty impressive. And it, it will really be good, and they'll trust you. Once you can be do, do that, and then they will trust your judgment and, and it will make a real difference in patient care. And, and I guarantee I would much rather you came to my house when I have my heart attack than some bozo who hasn't gone through, who doesn't recognize this sort of stuff. It's really important, okay? So, if it's coming off of the right, that's what's gonna happen. If it's coming off of the circumflex, it'll still be inferior, but now the direction is here because there's more left, it's coming off of the left circulation, there's more left ventricle, and so either two and three will be equal, or two will be greater than three. Okay? I did something. Yep. It's hard to do that. So can I do it on this? Can I can I do it here? Good. That's what I did here. Oh, oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Just go there. We got five minutes. Five minutes. All right. That's what C even happened. So this is C three is greater than two. Okay, and if you see it's negative in AVL, that's what we're talking about. And if you look over here in V4R, and if you then you visualize the vector in the frontal plane, it's going here. I mean, it all it does fit together. Now, there's one more lead. I I got to get the left main lesion with you. That's a circumflex. I forget it. I want to get to the left main. The left main. As I say, when when you get a left main occlusion, you're blocking both the LAD and the circ, right? But, but if the whole left ventricle stopped beating at once, the patient would die. So you rarely see patients with totally occluded left main coronaries in the emergency room. You will rarely see them, even in the ambulance, because they'll die before you get there. 
They just won't be beating until they get five minutes, you know, because they're five or ten minutes before their brain goes out and everything stops. So usually it'll spontaneously reperfuse, and when you do that, you're left with a region of ischemia that's around like this. But the, but the surface over here is generally okay. So the current of injury is going in this direction, and it's going in this direction and this direction. All of it's going inward towards that positive pole, sort of, and it's sort of towards the, the, towards the, uh, the right shoulder and a little bit towards uh, the anterior surface because most of the left ventricle is posterior. So it tends to be going towards the right ventricle, tends to be going a little superiorly because it's underneath here, and it tends to be going um, to the right shoulder. And so you see the characteristic electrocardiogram of that shows all this ST segment depression. And this is a left main occlusion. Now you can, if the patient is taken, has hypertrophy, has digitalis, is on drugs, it can confound it, but it's a slow heart rate and if this patient shows up with chest pain and shortness of breath, and that's why you're called to see him and has this electrocardiogram and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. And this is a nine lead. So if you want to go by the criteria that Marriott talks about, that comes actually from a paper by Scorboza and a group of people uh, that's a, that talks about ischemia and left bundle branch block. So you look for it in a lot of leads. And when you see that, that and if you look at that, and you see where, the, and you look, notice also there's ST elevation in AVR, which is the right shoulder, and there's a little ST elevation in V1. You can't, it's not much, it's not impressive, but AVR it is. So you can see it's, that's where the vector is going. So that's what you look for. So as a result of this, I'll tell you what we did, and this is what that paper has to do. And this was, we developed these kind of criteria, and we said, okay, this is if we have these criteria, and they're in the paper if you want to see them. Actually, I changed them a little bit. Uh, but if you have these criteria, you can make a prediction of left main proximal LED, non-proximal LED, proximal right, non-proximal, and left circumflex. You really have a way of predicting it. And what we did was we did a study where we took all comers to the emergency room that came in with acute coronary syndromes and who went to the cath lab emergently. We looked at the cardiograms without looking at the cath and we tried to, to predict, to guess where the lesion was based upon these criteria. That's what we did. And that's, and that's the paper you have. Okay, and this was the study, and this was, look at the positive and the negative predictive value. The positive predictive value means that if those changes were present, we were online. The negative means if they weren't there, they didn't have it. We were great. We had 11 left main lesions and we hit them all. We didn't miss any. Uh, I guess we must have missed one. It wasn't there in one and we missed it, okay? The positive predictive accuracy was very good for uh, pretty, pretty good, you know, in the 70% range for here, in the 70% range for here. If we look just at left main and left anterior descending proximal, which were the two major ones that we were trying to avoid to recognize, we had an 80% proximal predictive value and a 90% negative predictive value, which means if it wasn't there, the likelihood of their having them was pretty remote. If it was there, we may have misdiagnosed it and made some, it may have been something else than we call it, usually more distal than we were calling it, okay? But so it, it, it's not bad. It's really pretty good as a starting point for where you can do it. And it meant to us, and it changed our approach at, at University of North Carolina in the emergency room so that it enabled our cardiac fellows and the ER docs to say, this is a proximal lesion, let's get them right to the cath lab, no screwing around, you know? And don't worry about where their insurance form is. Don't worry about who their, their primary doc is. Get them upstairs. Get them to the lab. And, and it really did make a difference. And so I think that if you can think about those things, if you can think about visualizing where that ST segment is going and from that, where that correlates to the blockage in the, in the circulation, that you're one step further along. Uh, sort of in your ability to assess the patient. And I think it's, it's, it's going to really improve things. So anyway, so the conclusions, etc. You know, ST, it's got to be there. ST elevation has got to be ST depression. ST depression has got to be ST elevation. I mean, you know, the sun goes up, sun goes down. It's the way it is. And the <laughs> uh, if you look, so you want to look at ST depression as well as elevation because then you can predict 
where the lesion is with pretty good accuracy. And if it isn't there, if it isn't where you think it is, it's even better accuracy. So the pr negative predictive value is really pretty good. So we, as you, you're already doing this, it, I think this should be in all patients with inferior infarctions because it really helps particularly identify the right ventricular infarctions, and that's important. Uh, and then this visualization of the spatial orientation of the ST segment vector is, is the ST segment. I think is what you have to be able to do. You don't need the machine to print it for you. You can visualize it if you just look and know where the leads are, where the positive and negative poles are, and, and know what you're, ta what you're looking at. It really makes a huge difference. C'est tout, c'est fini. Merci. Thank you very much.